the title of this one is data loops and what we're really talking about is layer two layer two doesn't have any way to stop looping to, to stop things going around and around and around forever and ever and ever uh, unless we use this protocol called spanning tree and it does that by breaking the loop by turning off one of the ports so that the loop gets broken. In layer three, we have the, uh, the TTL, the time to live, which only allows us to go over a certain number of, uh, of routers before it says, oh, you've gone far enough. We can't get there. We're not ever gonna get there. And you'll get an error message back that says that it expired. <clears throat> the packet expired in route. Uh, common problems where the data is continuously flowing in the same direction are the data loops uh, to do these things. Symptoms of data loops, high utilization of the link, 100%, high CPU utilization, constant relearning and flapping of the MAC address, excessive drops in the output, network congestion, it just stops. Spanning tree protocol was designed to, to prevent these loops. Told you I have stories. One of the stories uh, that uh, we, we would have is we had a guy that, that uh, at uh, Roanoke who had helped set up a big concern, a big building, a big business in Chicago. Uh, it was a mutual fund or something. I don't know what it was. Multiple stories, multiple stations. One that if the network goes down, they're going to lose money. And they decided they didn't want to use this spanning tree protocol because it sends little bitty packets pretty frequently. They opted to not do it, to turn it off. He got a call one day, network's down. And they flew him from Roanoke to Chicago to fix the network. Said he walked into the NOC, the Network Operations Center at the at the uh, location, and moved one wire. Somebody had created a loop. What I want to do with this. And first, I want to turn these guys off so that they're not sending any traffic out here. I want to turn off. Spanning tree is turned on on this one. You can tell because one of these ports here shows as an amber color, which means that it is in a, what's called blocking state. It's not sending data. But what I want to do is to turn spanning tree off on these things. And it's on a per VLAN basis. There's only one VLAN on this thing right now, but... Config T, no, spanning tree, VLAN 1. And then we'll turn it off here, I hope. No, spanning tree, VLAN 1. And you notice that it turned that one green. And then we'll do the same thing here. No, I see if I can get enable probably would work better, huh? Config T, you know, spanning tree VLANs. It is a per V, it's on a per VLAN basis when we do that. Now I want to go into simulation mode and turn these guys back on. One of the reason this this is actually one of the uh of the demos that will bog down the packet tracer. This one is 1.3, so this one's probably 1.2. What I want to do here is to ping 192.168.1.3. And we'll send this information, and we go into our switch, and we should flood it out all the ports except the port that it came in on. So we flooded out all the ports except the port that it came in on. There's some other stuff going on. We got some ARP traffic going on over here, if you look to the right what kind of a what kind of traffic I have ICMP so we have ARP traffic uh, going on on this thing now we got a bunch of traffic going all over creation 
So it keeps getting flooded from one to the other because when it goes from one to the other, we're still we're still doing the ARP traffic, trying to figure out what's going on where with these things. You get the idea that we have you know, a lot of stuff going on on this thing. Let's get back to this one. And we'll go ahead and go because you see, you can see, hopefully you can see that traffic's going all over creation uh, with this thing. So when we go to real time, you notice this is going kind of uh, dark green. Pinging and now we're getting timed out. We're getting timed out because our network is so busy with the traffic trying to figure out where to go in this layer two data loop that we're not going anywhere. We're not getting anything done with it. The way we fix that is to turn spanning tree back on on the devices and when we do this it, it immediately it puts them in we're, we're waiting we're going through the spanning tree process for these things and control a will take you back to the uh, uh, front of these of the uh, of the devices uh, we'll do that and we will turn it back on for all of them so we've got spanning tree running. What's going on is we have a negotiation process going on with the devices. And we're going to elect a device called the root bridge. And then each of the devices, each of the switches are going to determine the best path to the root bridge. And when we get done, we're going to wind up with, in this little configuration, one of the ports is going to be blocked. It's not going to be turned on. So it will stop the looping that goes on with these things. Okay, we've got this one down here is still amber. If I go back to the simulation and now do the same thing, ping 1.3, and see if we can get there. And this one is still sending, instead of sending all the ARP, floods it out all the ports except the port it came in on, but it can't go anywhere from here. So it now, and we do the same flooding here, but it gets down here, can't go anywhere because this port is turned off, basically. It did get to its device, and now it's coming back to its device out of the ports that are now listed in the MAC address table back to real time so spanning tree is the protocol that prevents the layer two loops that will shut down a network and in, and in the case the real life experience of my friend it did shut down the network 802.1d bridge and layer two link management protocol so the protocol number specification of this thing is 802.1d it's a layer two protocol link management that allows us to have physical loops without having logical loops prevents the undesirable loops caused by cam or mac table instability a host receive the same frame multiple times, multiple locations. The MAC address is going to be uh, changing. The MAC address table is going to be changing frequently because first it comes in on one port and then it comes in on the other port. And every time it comes in on a different port, it then uh, has to change the MAC address table. Uh, so it's going to receive the frame multiple times. The, Proper functioning on a layer two network should only have one active path between two stations so that we don't have those things. And that, again, is what spanning tree is going to do for us. Uh, the operation is transparent. It's enabled by default. You can turn it off, as you saw. Probably not such a good idea to turn it off, but we can. Some terms here, and then I want to do a, a different demo after we take a break. We have the root switch. 
a BPDU, a bridge protocol data unit. We have PDUs, the uh, don't some people fight back. The BPDUs, bridge protocol data units, are the way that the bridges share this information in order to uh, uh, negotiate and elect the, uh, the uh, offices that need to be elected. We have a root port and a designated port uh, for these things. And we assume one instance per network for the 802.1D. 802.1D was the original, and as you might expect, we're beyond the original. We're going to have a couple of them. We're going to have some variations of this. And, and we, the one instance per network means it didn't matter how many VLANs that we had, we only had one instance running, which meant that when we go back to this configuration, we would have a single blocked port in the entire network for all of the VLANs. When we do it on a per VLAN basis, we can configure it so that some of the traffic for one of the VLANs, this might be a blocked port. The other VLANs, this might be a blocked port. The other ones, this might be a blocked port. So that we're using all of the capability of the network and not sending everything along the same path. We can have multiple paths that allow them to go from one to the other uh, that, to allow a little bit of balancing uh, and, and well, we have the redundancy, and the redundancy here is if, and I'll not keep switching, I'll do this and then we'll take, a, take our break here. If one of these, let's say one of these goes down and one of these goes down, gig 0, 2 to gig 0, 1, one of these goes down because I'm just going to take it out. What's going to happen in the process here? And, and given a little bit of time, and let's see if we can sh see what's going on here. Oh, and I should have done this. Show spanning tree. It's now in. It's listen. It's it's listening. It's in what's called listening state. And I'm gonna go down here. I'll put this side by side so that we can see when it turns green here. This takes about a minute for this whole process uh, to take place. It's now it's in learning state. So we have listening state and learning state. We were blocked before. It was in a blocking state. And again, I should have started this a little earlier listening and we're still in learning and now we are in forwarding state so we go from blocking to listening to learning to forwarding a process and you yes, said it took a little bit of time for that to happen and the amount of time it took for that to happen is about 50 seconds five zero seconds not blazingly fast but it sure beats having to uh uh bring somebody from Roanoke, Virginia to Chicago, it's a lot quicker than, they, than it would take to fly there. This one's going to go through the process. It's, it turned this one off again already. So these guys are now going to go through the negotiation to be sure that they're not going to form a loop. And that's what this is all about is, is layer two loops uh, that will form and shut down our network. Okay, let's continue with spanning tree. I think what I like, I've got a little little simulator on how all this, then maybe we'll get some of these terms uh, sorted out with the imagery that goes on with this thing. But the root switch, the BPDU, the root port, the designated port, what does all that mean? Uh, the terms that we'll use, use in this. This is a, and this is in your share in the useful info if you want to run it, uh, a little, little, imagery here they say bridges and we call it even though it switches we're going to call these things the root bridge when we do these things so each of these things are connected in the triangle like we looked at in the demo when we crashed the network by turning off spanning tree and each of these guys have a bridge id and the bridge IDs are a priority, and each of them by default is 32768. You can see on these things, 32768. Appended to the MAC address, and we use really big MAC addresses here, one, two, and three. 
in switches, the lowest typically is going to win the election. And what's going to happen here is we're going to elect a root bridge. Now, when you think about the elect a root bridge with the lowest of, you might say, you know, I really don't want that guy to be the root bridge, probably because he's going to have a lot of responsibility in the lowest root bridge, since everything starts out with the same bridge ID, the same priority, 32768, which is configurable. Uh, the one with the lowest MAC address going to win, probably going to be the oldest, most least capable, most incapable, the least capable device. So we can configure the priorities. We can specify which one of the devices that we want to be the root bridge, and we can do that on a per VLAN basis to do that. But anyhow, let's take a look at the process that goes on with this thing. At the boot up, they all think that they are the root bridge and they, I am root, I am root, everybody is root. Then they're going to start sharing their BPDUs. Assume that the first step is bridge C sends the BPDU, the bridge protocol data unit, to bridges A and B, announcing that he's root. So he sends this thing to both of these guys. I am root. We do, we the bridges then do a comparison. Switches do a comparison here. My ID is lower than C's. I am root. Over here on B, B says, hey, you know, C is lower, so C is root. My root ID is higher, so C is the root bridge. Now, bridge B or router switch B thinks that C is root. A still thinks he's root, and C thinks he's root. So now the next step is bridge A is going to send its BPDUs to bridge uh, B and C. And this ought to help us get the situation resolved here, because now when they do the comparisons over here, B is doing the comparison. My root ID is higher that A, A is going to be the root. And C ought to figure out the same thing here, that its bridge ID is higher. Uh, my root ID is higher, so A is root. Now they all agree who is the root bridge. The reason we elect the root bridge is so that each of the switches can find a loop-free path to the root, and it's going to do it based upon port cost when, when we do that. So the next step in the process is every non-root bridge must elect one root port. This is one that just, you know, it's kind of, uh, this is the way it is, back to the learning the language. The root port is the one that goes towards the root bridge. There are no root ports on the root bridge. may sound a little odd, but that just that is the way that it is. So the root port goes towards the root bridge. The root bridge doesn't have any root ports on it. So every non-root must select one root port and the way it's going to go toward the root bridge. And in this case, we're going to have to know what the cost is for these things. And the assumption here is that they're all 100 megabit links. And the cost, the defined cost for a 100 megabit link is 19. So when we look at these things, each of them is going to have a cost of 19, port 1. And obviously, it's going to be the root port going to the root bridge. And this one's going to be the root port going to the root bridge because any other way, we've got 19 and 19. If we go any other direction, we're going to have a 38 uh, for the cost. Uh, the designated ports, root ports connect to designated ports. So on the root bridge, everything is going to be a designated port. Sometimes you're going to see it called a forwarding port when we do that. Containing the designated port is given. Uh, the segment is referred to as the designated bridge for that segment when we do that. So segment one 
two and three, we have these things. We have the designated ports on the root bridge. We've got these guys going here. We've got to do something about segment three because if we don't do something about segment three, we're going to wind up with that loop that we had earlier and shut down our network again. So it is then the, uh, the path uh, cost of the root bridge is the same for bridges B and C. The tiebreaker is the lower bridge ID of bridge C for these things. Remember I said the lower of typically wins in switches. So what we've got to do here is figure out which one of these ports is going to be blocked and which one of these ports are going to be forwarding, going to be turned on. And that is going to be determined by the lower bridge ID. This one is 2 and this one is 3. So the designated port, the forwarding port is going to be on bridge C and the blocked port then is going to be on the non-designated port. The blocked port is going to be on bridge B. So we have a bunch of them forwarding. This one's forwarding but it's not going anywhere because this is going to be the blocked port uh, that we that we will be using for these things. So we have Forwarding ports, we have the root port, the designated ports, root ports on the devices going towards the root bridge. And the, uh, let's see, going towards the root bridge, the root ports, root port going towards the root bridge in each of these things. And this one's just a designated port. It's not a root port yet. It could be, depending on what happens in this thing, if one of the, one of the devices goes down, but the root bridge has all designated ports. Root bridge, root port, root bridge, designated ports. The designated port here just is in a forwarding state when we do it. Let's see. The next bridge C is a better BPDU than bridge C. So the BPDU here. Um, yeah, the bridge protocol data units. If bridge B fails to receive the BPDUs for the max age timer, which is going to be 20 seconds, uh, by default, it, it will start the transition to the forwarding mode. If this then says, for any reason, bridge B doesn't receive these BPDUs, then it's going to, it was blocked, now it's going to be in forwarding state. And the uh, spanning tree failure, the block port has gone into forwarding state and the spanning tree failure has occurred on this thing. You can, if you want to play with this thing, it is in the share folder in the useful info. But hopefully some of the terminology, and I just want to look at some of the other, we, we showed the, the little three and we have one block port. You're not necessarily just going to have one block port. This has a root port here. These are gig to gig, which is going to be a, a cost of four, a cost of four, cost of four, cost of 19. What's going to be the path? Obviously, this one's going to be a four. If we went this way, it would be 12. If we went this way, it would be even more. This one... 419. So the system is going to block the required ports uh, for these things. The root bridge again is going to be elected and all default, all things being default, the uh, device with the lowest MAC address is going to win that election. And again, remember, lowest MAC address may mean most incapable or the least capable device. Uh, that we would have available. So we can dictate the root bridge uh, and we can do that on a per VLAN basis in order to do a little bit of load balancing and to maybe have a little bit more capable device uh, to be our root, our root bridge. Our root. And again, we use the term bridge even though they are switches when we do these things. Spanning tree, this is going to go through some some things here. Uh, e here, the root switch has all the ports that are either in the designated or as a backup role, the designated role. This, this is sending the information from one to the other. And we, we looked at the loop 
and that's what this one is showing. We looked at the loop. We don't have anything here that's going to be in, in the block state. And we are going to create a disaster when we, when we do that. When we enable spanning tree, we're going to have one of the uh, links is going to be a block link. And that's going to stop the layer 2 looping. And the only way to do that actually is to turn one of the ports off. But we don't have any way inside of the uh, of the protocols like we do with layer three with the uh, with the TTL, the time to live, that says, "Hey, you've gone far enough. Drop the packet." Uh, we can't do that with the frames at layer two, so we have to do a physical blocking by blocking the port when we do that. There are several modes of this thing. And we'll start with rapid spanning tree protocol. We're going to get into some of the specifics. And, and if they don't get the other labs working, I've got some spanning tree labs. They've actually done away with them, and I'd like to do them anyway. We do some configurations just to see what goes on with this thing. Uh, rapid spanning tree 802.1w. A little different. We had 802.1d was what we started out with spanning tree, which was the original spanning tree. One uh, of the... Uh, uh, one instance for the entire switch on the per VLAN, which we'll get to in a few minutes, in a few in in the next couple of uh, bullets here, it's going to be a situation where we can create some load balancing that goes on here. One route for the entire topology with the rapid, not the rapid per VLAN, eliminated the forwarding delay of 15 seconds by default. We'd say something that we've delayed that we hadn't talked about yet. When we do this, and when we do this thing, and when we were looking at it a little earlier, and we uh, uh, let's go in and do this. When we had the, and let me try to do a little bit better job. Uh, when we had the situation here, and let's do a, I don't want to do that. I want to keep it over here so that we can see kind of what's happening over here. Maybe we can stretch this and move this over and stretch this out and let's show spanning tree and we have this one here it says an alternate it's in the block state this cost of 19 fast ethernet zero one and it is fast Ethernet 01. I know I keep turning these things off and on. So let's go make, let's break it and let's see what happens in this thing. We'll break it right here and we'll go back to it and it's still in a blocking state. It should stay in a blocking state for 20 seconds. So I'm not timing it, but we can see it seems like in, a, in eternity here, it's in blocking state. Now we're going to listening state. So blocking for 20 seconds, listening for 15 seconds. And this is in the, uh, the, the per VLAN or the, the default one. We're in listening for 15 seconds. It's listening uh, to determine the topology. Blocking is just sits there and just waits to say, oh, maybe I didn't, maybe I made a mistake. Now it's in learning, and in the learning stage, it's going to be learning MAC addresses that goes on, and it should be 15 seconds in the learning. Now we're in forwarding, so blocking state 20 seconds, listening state 15 seconds, learning state 15 seconds, 15, 15, 30 plus 20, 50 seconds, almost a minute in order to bring uh, the port up to do that. So the what we talk about in the rapid, and that's the per VLAN, which is the uh, default configuration was on that switch. But in the rapid, when we configure it, and it is a configurable thing, we eliminate the, the forwarding delay of 15 seconds by default. So we take one of those 15 second uh, delays out of there with the rapid one. Per VLAN spanning tree, which is the one that was configured on, on those switches by default, is the Cisco default mode. 
one root port for each VLAN. Again, we haven't done VLANs yet. We'll do them probably, it'll probably be actually be uh, Thursday before we do the actual VLANs. We'll get into uh, IP uh, tomorrow and we'll finish up the switches tomorrow. But it's the default mode, one per VLAN. What that means is we can have the multiple paths and, and have multiple uh, you know, multiple spanning tree instances running on a switch that the block ports are going to be different for uh, each of the VLANs. It gives us a little bit of load balancing so that we don't have one port just sitting there block waiting for something to fail and say, okay, now I got it. Uh, it will be, the block ports will be different for each of the, uh, each of the VLANs that we do. It's based on the 802.1D standard, which was the original spanning tree. Uh, which was one per uh, switch when we do that. The rapid per VLAN, uh, the same as the per VLAN spanning tree plus, except that it uses a rapid convergence based on the 802.1W standard, the one up here. It's the one that's going to eliminate some of the timing and it, it will become faster. We also have a multiple spanning tree, which is a, a little bit of a different animal multiple VLANs are mapped to a single instance of the multiples. Why would we do that? If we have multiple instances running on a switch you have to do the calculations for each VLAN. We have three or four not a big deal. Let's say we have 200 uh, VLANs. If we have to do 200 calculations on every switch it's going to get pretty bogged down. So what the multiple does is maps multiple VLANs, maybe 1 to 50, VLANs 1 to 50 to instance 1. Uh, maybe 51 to 100 to instance 2 and on down the line. When you have the multiple running on the devices, you're always going to have an instance 0 that's running. So whenever you get questions that say we have these running and how many you have one more you're going to have instance zero which is kind of a management kind of keeping track of the uh, the multiple vlan instances uh, per vlan and uh, per vlan plus an enhancement of the per vlan spanning tree protocol we haven't talked about isl yet but it only ran on isl which is the uh, Cisco proprietary it stands for Inter Switch Link Protocol is the Cisco proprietary uh, frame tagging protocol, which is the one that they actually have taken out of the switches. We now use 802.1Q for frame tagging. Per VLAN spanning tree plus the difference between the two is PVST runs on only on ISL. PVST plus runs on 802.1Q, which is the tagging protocol that we use today. But it supports support for 802.1Q. That's the plus part of it. Uh, not supported on non-Cisco devices. Cisco proprietary, Cisco default. When we do those things. Single instance, configured for each VLAN. That's what the PV per VLAN uh, stands for, for those things. Uh, Loop-free a path between all the nodes in a switched layer to VLAN and the rapid per VLAN based on the 802.1W the rapid spanning tree protocol standard and it is on a per VLAN the PV it is easy to change these things from one to the other uh, eliminate one of the forward delays uh, we can do that and, and, uh, and I've got some uh, demos that I'll try to get set up at lunch. I'll go find them uh, and uh, look at what this per VLAN business means and what the rapid business mean, means uh, when we do that. Im hopefully imagery will help. The, I'll tell you that a rapid makes it a lot more rapid than it really does in the, in the, uh, in the packet tracer. So the indicators of these things and the running config and in the show command and, and we can look at the at the one here when we do a, a show let's see show spanning tree. Let me go ahead and make this one full, I guess. Show spanning tree VLAN one. I can only have one VLAN on here. 
the protocol IEEE, this is going to tell me it's a per VLAN spanning tree uh, when we do that. The priority here, and then it also, the, the priority 32769. Remember it said it's 32768 is the default. It is. The priority is going to be 32768 plus the VLAN number, whatever it is for these things. The cost of this one's 23. Uh, the port, uh, 25 on this. And then the hello time, 10 seconds. The maximum age timer, this is where the 20 seconds. The maximum age timer is 10 times the hello. When I talked about earlier the network, they a lot of little bitty frames that go around here, a lot of them, they're sent over two seconds. Forward delay is 15 seconds, and we do it twice, for, once for the listening state, and once for the learning state. The bridge ID, the root, this is the root ID, the bridge ID, same sort of things, everything's gonna be the same except the MAC address, obviously. This tells us what the MAC address is of the root bridge. And the root bridge, once you get there, I didn't really wanna do that. Once you get there, and I broke this one, and let's just let's let's see if we can put this back. Yeah, I can't do that. Okay, I get it. That's not gonna. Let's see if that. See, it changed. It changed it for me. I didn't want it. I didn't want to do that because that doesn't auto uh, uh, auto connect. So let's use the. Uh, yeah, I think it was gig zero one to probably to gig zero two or something like that. Anyhow, spanning tree should fix this back for us. Let's go to to this one and do the show spanning tree, and then we're in the learning state for this one. But it says this bridge is root clearly states that this is the root bridge. So now we know this is the root bridge. And then when we get there in learning, all of the ports should be in, in a forwarding mode after we get out of the learning state for this thing. And we're in forwarding. And then we get the cost because we have, it's four because we have a gig to a gig. If we did a gig to a fast ethernet, it'll revert to whatever the slowest port is uh, to go from one to the other when we do that. So the rapid per VLAN spanning tree, once we configure it in the running config, rapid dash PVST. In the show spanning tree, it'll just say RSTP. Uh, per VLAN spanning tree plus PVST, IEEE, which we saw, that's the default. MST multiple, MST and MSTP is going to be in the show spanning tree protocol. I can't configure multiple in packet tracer uh, we'll look at maybe uh, you in know in, when, when we get a little bit further into this, do some configurations and, and look at some rapid and and some multiple VLANs. The reason I think I've got to configure some VLANs because I don't think I've got any on any of the demos here. The compatibilities per VLAN and, and what this is saying is we have per VLAN spanning tree plus and we put some switches in and make them rapid can they still communicate with each other? And the answer is yes, but they're going to revert to the per VLAN spanning tree. We're going to, we're going to have the slower uh, uh, setup that goes on this thing. The, uh, the slower configuration is going to go on. The multiple spanning tree uh, with per VLAN, so yes, yes, with restrictions and the rapid uh, with uh, the, the per VLAN, yes, reverts, and then with the multiple, yes, reverts to PVST plus, and then rapid to rapid, obviously, it's going to be a yes. It'll be able to uh, communicate with its own protocol when we do these things. The multiple, which we talked about a little bit, uh, uses uh, the RSTP for rapid convergent, enables multiple VLANs to be grouped into and map to the same spanning tree instance. This will allow us to not have as many instances. And again, if we have if we have three or four VLANs, not a big deal. If we have 200 VLANs, it becomes a bigger deal because instead of doing calculations 
to block the ports for one or two or three or four VLANs. We're now doing calculations for 200 VLANs, which can take some significant resources away from these things. So what we do with a multiple is map these things to regions, and it uses regions, maps the uh, instances of, uh, of VLANs to uh, multiple instances so that we don't have as much calculation going on with these things. So this is a S1 and S2 here for these things it goes into uh, region 1 and then IST1 it's going to be the instance 2 instances an internal instance and a configured instance region 2 we're going to have instance 2 here for this thing and then if we send it someplace else, we have a S5 here. Multiple forwarding paths for the data traffic. I don't know that that one is such a good representation of what goes on. What we have is we're mapping multiple uh, instances to one instance so that we have less calculation, load, better load balancing, but all of the VLANs that are mapped to an instance are going to be using the same one. The first one that, that talked about uh, the the management instance, I think it was. Let's go back here. The, the internal instance and the configured instance, two instances here to do that. If we have a single one here, we're always going to have an internal instance to keep track of what goes on uh, with the system. Load balancing, the number of... Spanning tree instances required for a large number of VLANs, uh, which means that we're going to uh, have fewer calculations going on. Uh, the configuration requirements are going to be the name of the instance, the revision, and we'll talk about revision numbers or the revision that we're going to use for these things a little later when we do some things and then the, the VLAN to instance mapping so what revision what revision number how many times does it change we have to specify that when we do these things proves the fault tolerance of the network and failure in one instance doesn't affect the other instances same thing as the, uh, the calculations that would go on are going to be obviously fewer for this one the port states, we looked at this a little bit earlier when, when I turned it off and then we actually did the show uh, uh, spanning tree. Uh, blocking, default boot up, everything goes into the blocking state. Uh, and we're going to have some configurations that doesn't do that uh, because if we've got computers connected, well, there's no way that the end devices are going to create uh, loops and that's what this process this protocol is all about is preventing uh, layer 2 loops so we're going to go into blocking state from blocking uh, the 20 seconds is the max age state and we saw that one 10 times the uh, the hello time is what's going to be used here so we're going to be in 20 seconds in the blocking state then we'll go into listening state the link shows us up and this one is going to be eliminated in the rapid spanning tree protocol. This is, we, we eliminated one of the forward delays. We used two forward delays, 15 seconds. In the per VLAN, in the regular spanning tree, we're going to have the 15 seconds here. Then we go into learning state, which is still going to have its 15 seconds, uh, even in rapid. So in rapid, we eliminate the 15 seconds here. And then after that, we get into forwarding. So in the per VLAN, the default is going to take 50 seconds, almost a minute in order for a, a, a port to come up. As we go through the rest of this, we'll see some configurations that we can do to make this a little bit faster uh, to go from one to the other. The states that we have, uh, blocking state, when we enable it, an interface always enters into the blocking state. Uh, when we connect the devices, and I guess I don't need to show that again hopefully, but when I connected the, the uh, uh, cable up to the port and did the show spanning tree, it was still in blocking state. 
So initially, everything's going to be in a blocking state. And this is kind of where, okay, let me figure out what's going on here uh, with this thing. Uh, we'll receive BPDUs, the Bridge Protocol Data Units. And what the BPDUs are being used for is we're send, they're, they're sending all that information around in order to determine whether the port should be in an upstate or a downstate the root bridge, all those other things that we're that we're doing. Should it be in forwarding state? Is it a root port? Is it a designated port? Is it a block port? Uh, it's going to receive the interface in the blocking state will receive BPDUs. If none are received, it will start to transition to the forwarding state. Because that means that something's happened. Something's keeping the BPDUs from getting to it. So it's saying, okay, I need to activate myself. So it does not forward the frames or learn addresses at this point. At this point. Uh, can be any port except the root or designated ports, the blocking state uh, for these things. The blocking state is going to be a stable state. It's not... It's not in, in transition because once we block these things they're going to be in the blocking state until uh, it doesn't until it starts not receiving BPDUs. As long as it receives more, uh, more useful BPDUs than it can send out it's going to remain in blocking state. That means that it's not got a better cost or it's not got a better path to the root bridge uh, before. In the 802.1W the rapid this one is renamed the discarding state and we blocking and, and we're going to have a couple of things in the that are going to be combined in the discarding state for these things it's a stable state which means it's not a transitory state in the listening state the first after the blocking state does not participate in frame forwarding yet receives BPDUs, but it does not learn MAC addresses. It's more interested in the uh, in the topology right now, what's going on. Listening for the location of the root bridge. And this one is not used in 802.1W. 802.1W is a rapid uh, spanning tree. Forwarding delay uh, for this thing, and it's a transitory state, and it's 15 seconds. So this is where the 15 seconds goes away in the uh, in the rapid one of the, one of the ways that we get a more rapid uh, uh, convergence for these things. The learning state doesn't forward frames, but it's going to learn MAC addresses. Uh, discards and the frames is going to be received. The forwarding delay here another 15 seconds. Uh, learning where the root bridge is located, it's a transitory state. So we have two transitory states here with the listening and the learning state. Forwarding state, after all of the negotiation takes place, the port gets turned on, is in forwarding state, participates in frame forwarding, receiving and forwarding, learns MAC addresses. This is the stable converged state for the, uh, uh, for the topology. The disabled state is when we give the shutdown command. It doesn't participate in spanning tree. It's non-operational. It doesn't participate in anything because we turned it off with the shutdown command. Uh, does not receive BPDUs, doesn't forward flame, frames, and doesn't learn MAC addresses. And this is part of the discarding in 802.1W. So we had discarding 802.1W for now disabled state and blocking state was called discarding state because it's discarding everything that comes into it. And it is also going to be a stable state. A summary, a couple of summary tables here. The, uh, uh, the blocking state, no for frame forwarding, no, no. Stable, whether they stable or transitory. And the big thing is listening. Does it learn MAC addresses? The learning state does. Listening and blocking, uh, blocking obviously doesn't. Listening doesn't. Listening is a transitory and as is learning. Forwarding is a stable state and then it's going to forward frames as well as learn the MAC addresses. And the terminology 802.1D, disable, blocking, listening, learning, forwarding. 802.1W, the rapid discarding, discarding, listening isn't there. 
and then learning and forwarding. So it, it goes directly from discarding to learning uh, MAC addresses in the rapid, uh, in the O2.1W, the rapid spanning tree protocol or the per VLAN spanning tree protocol. The BPDUs, and this is one, is we've got an image here. I don't have one of these that I've captured uh, when we do that. Uh, the data message is transmitted across the lands, and it's, it is to detect loops in the network topologies, uh, contain the information necessary to configure, maintain the uh, spanning tree protocol for these things, sent by default every two seconds. So there are a lot of them, but they're not very big when we look at them. Uh, the bridge ID, these down here, the BTU, BPDU frame format, a little bit difficult to see down here, but we have the information here. And if you look in the notes, the uh, the types of uh, of BPDUs, we have the TC and the, the topology change notification, something changed. We need to go and recalculate the best paths for everybody. A configuration which is going to be uh, originated by the root bridge and then the acknowledgement is going to acknowledge receipt of these things. But like everything else, it's going to be sending information back and forth uh, from one to the other. Uh, the data messages, the types we have, and then the types in topology change notification. Uh, configuration, the TCN informs the other switches of port changes injected into the network by a non-root switch and it's propagated to the root. Telling the root, hey, something's happened here. The configuration uh, BPDU is going to be originated by the root bridge. It's going to flow to the active paths and then the acknowledgement, acknowledge, each of these are going to acknowledge receipt of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, of the notifications for these things. Uh, slide here a summary that maybe kind of represents some of the things why is it why are they the times the way they are the, the stp versus the rapid and then the rapid the the, the pluses the per vlan pluses for the uh, cisco devices in stp the hello time is two seconds we saw that in the show spanning tree the maximum age timer is going to be 10 times the hello timer once it's in a blocking state, it stays there for 20 seconds. Uh, then it moves into listening for 15 seconds and learning for 15 seconds. And that's how we get the 50 seconds. In the rapid spanning tree, the, the hello timer is still going to be two seconds, but we use three times the hello timer for the max age, which gives us six seconds. And then it moves into the learning state, discarding into the learning state, and it's going to be there for 15 seconds. So instead of having 50 seconds, we're somewhere around 21 seconds in order to bring the port up. Still not the best thing in the world, but it again beats uh, flying somebody from uh, Roanoke to Chicago in order to move one wire to fix the network when you created a loop and didn't use this uh, protocol. The root bridge, and these are some of the things that I think that we looked at, showed uh, what are they when I was trying to do the terminology in the, in the demo. The root bridge is the central reference point of the spanning tree. First thing that happens is we elect the root bridge and then everything will do the calculations, the cost calculations using the BPDU shares in order to find its best path to the root bridge, its most efficient path. To the root bridge. So it's a central reference point. We can designate a secondary root bridge if we want to. If it fails, then they would have a new election, obviously. But if it fails and we have a designated secondary, then the designated secondary is going to take over. And, and that is one of the configurations that we can do. We can do a configuration to where we specify, yep, this we want you to be the root for this VLAN. And then we can also specify secondary so that if the primary root fails, then the secondary root will take over from it. So the step one in the convergence determine the root switch or the root bridge. The next thing that's going to happen is each 
Configuration BPDU has the following information, the bridge ID, uh, the priority 32768 by default. This is a configurable item and it's configurable in increments of 1024. Uh, you have to have a 1024 increment or it won't take it. And then the MAC address is going to be six bytes in, the, in this thing. Uh, other things are available in it. We're going to have the root path cost that goes here, the age of the message, and then the values, the max age timer, uh, the hello timer, and, and the hello delay timer are going to be in here. So the BPDU is going to uh, uh, pass a, a certain amount of information or we have the, certain, the information that has to go from switch to switch in order to be able to create this thing. The root bridge election, again, we looked at that in the simulator. Exchange BPDUs result in the election. The lowest bridge ID becomes the root bridge. If we configure the, the priority, the 32768, and set it lower, since it's in the most significant bits or the most significant digits, it's going to dictate which one of the devices is going to be the root bridge. And the other one is we just we just specify root bridge or we can specify priority for these things. If we the lowest priority is, is determined if it's going to be a tie, and it will be a tie unless we do some configurations because the default 32768 for everything, then the lowest MAC address wins. Keep in mind, the lowest MAC address may not be the best choice for this because it's probably going to be the device that was made first. Can be manually configured to force a root selection. Uh, the lowest path cost is going to be the path to the root bridge. The root port goes towards the root bridge. Designated ports on the root bridge to do these things. The lowest sender bridge ID is going to be used to determine these paths. And the lowest sender port ID, if everything, it's going to be the lowest of when we when we go from one to the other. The lowest sender bridge ID, yep, that's the one that we're going to have the block port. If we have a bunch of equals and, and we have e, multiple ports connected, the lowest port ID is going to be the one. The, the uh, pro priorities, we do the priority and then the port ID. And the port ID is the port number. The, uh, the default port priority is 128 uh, for everything that we use for these things. The root bridge sp show spanning tree VLAN ID will indicate the root width. This bridge is root. We saw that. Uh, the root ID and the bridge ID max are going to be equal. And the root switch has no root ports. They're going to be uh, designated ports. In the forwarding states, no blocking ports are going to be on it because it's going to be the one that's going to uh, be required for our devices to get there. In this one, this, this bridge is root. We looked at that one. The, the MAC addresses for the root ID and the bridge ID are going to be the same. And the root switch has no, has no root ports. They're all in a forwarding state when we do those things. All of them are in forwarding state. Uh, all ports are in a forwarding state. This one down here is a different one. A uh, root port goes toward the root bridge. Look for a different, uh, different one. Let me see where we are here. Uh, the convergence steps, and then we will... We take lunch. The uh, port selections, the root bridge, and then the not root bridges. The uh, determine the root bridge of the root switch, and <clears throat> each non root switch selects its root port. And we're going to have one designated port selected per segment, and a blocking remains port uh, blocking remaining ports that could form loops when we do that thing. And we did the demo of, is why we would want to uh, to block those devices. Look at something here real quick that I've created this network with multiple VLANs on it and 
it saved things for me before I was ready. This is going to be the root switch up here for uh, VLAN 1. If I go in here and do a show VLAN or show VLAN show spanning tree, then we've got VLAN 1. This bridge is root. VLAN 20, this bridge is root. VLAN 30, it's not. I have changed it. It, it has a root port and it has an alternate port that is blocked uh, going to it. And we have the protocol IEEE is going to be the per VLAN spanning tree protocol. A couple other things that we kind of talked about, kind of didn't talk about. The interface, the designated ports here, and this is a, a, a root bridge. The priority here on the port numbers is 128. The gigabit ports become 26 and 25, gig 0, 1, because we have fast Ethernet 0 through 24 will be the, or 1 through 24, will be the uh, 1 through 24 port numbers, and then 25 is gig 0, 1, and 26 is gig 0, 2. But VLAN 30, this is not the root bridge anymore. I tried to, and, and, and uh, Packet Tracer did me a favor and saved it before I was ready to, but for VLAN 50, this is the root bridge. What we can do, let's go to one of these other guys. So this is the route for some of these. Let's go to, actually let's go to this guy here and make him be sure that the VLAN's here. Show VLAN 50. So let's make him the root bridge for VLAN 50. So it's going to be spanning tree VLAN 50 and then we're going to do root and then we can do here we can do a root primary or a root secondary we could also go in here and assign a priority if we wanted to and the priority here i said 1024 increments of 4096 i was lying i lied didn't I? so increments of 4096 we can assign a priority or we can just say that we make make it the root primary and then we could also make another one the root secondary it may take this a couple of seconds let's do a show spanning tree here and get down to vlan 50 this bridge is root uh, for it so we can now have uh, all of the ports are sending information sending data for some of the VLANs. You notice that they're all green, but we're not got that dark green that we had when we had the loop. What, what happened was this one was the block port, and I made this the uh, root port or the root bridge for uh, VLAN 30. Show spanning tree for this. And, and it then, since the uh, root bridge, everything has to be in the forwarding state here, VLAN 30. Uh, the priority, 24 is 606, it lowered the priority so that this guy can be the root bridge. And, the, and the, what in the slide, the priorities match uh, for this thing. Of course, the big, the big tipper here, this bridge is root to do these things. The hello time and all that other stuff is there. I guess what we could do when we're here is change the spanning tree mode rapid per VLAN spanning tree protocol on this guy and then we'll do a show spanning tree and get down here to VLAN 40 VLAN 30 they're blocking because it's it's got to redo its uh, its uh, whole negotiation process but it says that a protocol on it is rapid spanning tree protocol rapid spanning tree protocol on all of these on this particular uh, switch and i guess that we could just go ahead and make them all rapid and then uh you know yeah, let's do spanning tree mode rapid per vlan which would help in these guys it'll go through the negotiation process but that, that's what I, and, you, and the negotiation process, you notice that the negotiation process went a lot faster here. They're green already. This one, the packet tracer simulator shows it uh, doing it a little faster than it really would. And we got all of the VLANs because it's a, 
per VLAN rapid spanning tree protocol, doing the negotiation of turning on and off to do these things, but it is going to be faster. The six seconds, the 21 seconds, that wasn't 21 seconds, but uh, it will, does work quicker in the rapid. Uh, port rolls, and we'll look at more of the, of the, hope you can stay awake for the rest of the afternoon thing here. The algorithm assigns a role to each port on each switch and then calculates the best loop-free path. And we've done that. We saw that. It assigns a, uh, a duty to it. It can either be a, a forwarding port, a blocked port, or a root port that we have on those things. I'll go back to and, I'll, and I will probably do some back and forth. We have forwarding, 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 and then we have a blocked port. Uh, forwarding, forwarding to do these things. So let's see if we can find any of these that are going to be a root port. You think we'd have a root port in here somewhere, wouldn't you? I triple E, we're back to the uh, uh, per VLAN spanning tree. We're all in forwarding state. We got some blocking. Uh, forwarding and they're forwarding because we've configured this thing uh, in order to to have those different uh, uh, different routes on the different VLANs uh, to do that. So the port roles are the root port, and the root port is the best port to reach the reach the root bridge. Root ports go towards root bridges, and they connect to designated ports. Root ports connect to designated ports. Forwarding ports. The designated port uh, to use on a per segment basis to get to the root bridge. So we're going to go from one to the other in order to be able to go from one to the other. Block port uh, selected to accept BPDUs and nothing else to prevent the layer two loops. It's the one that's not going to be sending data for us. Alternate port, new term that has gotten in here. It's a block port that provides an alternate path to the root bridge in the spanning tree and then the block port is used uh, in the loop back configuration for parallel paths put this one in here the backup port here the backup port parallel configurations two of these going to the same location the one with the lower bridge id or the lower id port id and they're all going to be 128 and then after the lower uh, priority the one with the lower port number will get that. Here we have alternate ports. We have these two different switches here. The alternate port, an alternate path uh, to get to the to the destination. This is kind of a summary. The, the cost is something if you look at it and you say, well, we've got a cost 2004 and after and we have these numbers that I haven't seen in the book and you have these numbers that you haven't seen in the book. The costs that we still use to do the calculations typically are going to be the uh, the before 1998. 10 meg is 100, 100 meg is 19, a gig is 4, and a 10 gig is going to be 2, the cost for these things. It's kind of a relative thing. The reason that we have to keep changing the cost is because the ports get, keep getting faster and faster. The reason that we can still use this one is 100 gig in a, terab in a terabyte, uh, terabit, terabit per second, a billion bits per second. Anyhow, ter terra, ten, 10 gig billion, trillion, that's a trillion, isn't it? But we don't really have those devices yet. So when we do, we're going to have to use this cost over here. Otherwise, the 100 gig cost would be the same as the 10 gig. And that happened for a long time when we went from 10 to 100. Uh, we had the slower ones of 56K and uh, all those other other ones that uh, were there that uh, were much slower. And then the, the cost and for a long time, the uh, 10 and the 100 had the same cost. So the non root bridge port selection, the process that it goes through, the first first 
the eliminator, the first decision, the first thing is going to be the lowest path cost. If there is a tie, the lowest neighbor bridge ID. If there's still a tie, the lowest port priority. And it's 128 by default. It's just like the, uh, the 32768 that we had uh, that everything is the everything is the same when we uh, when we start up uh, to do these things so we have the 128 is going to be the default for these things and then after that the lowest port ID which is not going to be a tie but again you see as we go through this we have the lowest of lowest of lowest of for these things uh, the show spanning tree, the priority 32769, 32768 plus the VLAN ID. The one that we changed uh, the priority on when I set it as a root, it made it 24 something. It sets the priority lower than any of the other uh, bridges that are around so that that particular bridge will become the root bridge uh, when we do it. The, uh, the, the port. Here, the lowest, uh, the lowest port priority, again, they're all by default 128. And then after that, the lowest port ID, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, uh, to do those things. And that bridge was, was the root bridge. So in the spanning tree convergence, we're going to determine the root switch or the root bridge. And again, we use the terminology of bridge, but we are still talking about uh, switches when we do this thing. Each non-root switch selects a root port. The root port is the way that it gets to the root bridge. One designated port per segment and it would block the remaining ports that could, could form a length. Full convergence uh, process that takes all the switches from independence. Each thinks it's the STP root like we had in the simulation uh, to one of uniformity where each has a place in the loop free topology and all have agreed on a primary root switch. We have agreed that this, this guy or that guy is the root switch. This is, you know, just kind of a, yeah, we're going to have a bunch of different configurations here. Got a, an example here in a second. This one determined the root switch. We kind of go through a, uh, a little bit of a, of, a, of a lesser simulator than we had a little bit earlier. The root switch here, uh, the designated ports, all of the ports on the root switch are designated ports. The non-root bridges have one root port per root bridge. And if we look at this configuration, everything, we got a 19 here coming off of this guy, 19. Uh, four and the 19 and a four is the way that we're going to go in this direction. The four, uh, the four and the two, rather than the four and the four, uh, when we would go from one to the other, I guess we could do that in a little more detail. Uh, this guy is going to go in the root port is going to go in this direction because his total path cost is six. If he goes this way, the total path cost is going to be eight. This guy is going to go this direction because his path cost is going to be 23. If we went in the other direction, it would be 27 to do that. So 4, the root 4 is equal to path cost, different path cost, different cost, different ways to get from one to the other. But that's the process that it uses to do these calculations. One designated port per segment here. And in this one, the designated ports up here, this is going to be a root port, designated port, designated port. Designated ports connect to root ports, except in this case, I think we're going to wind up with a blocked in here somewhere. So we're going to have a blocked port in these, and the other end from the blocked port is going to be a designated port or a forwarding port. It's not going anywhere, but it, is, it forwards the information out of the port, and then it goes to the blocked port, goes nowhere. When we do those things. An example here, and let's see if we can do this, and you follow along with me, and let's see if I can mess this up, hopefully not too badly, but when we look at this thing, the task 
I've determined the root bridge, root ports, designated ports hasn't changed from 802.1D. It hasn't changed in a long time. To rapid spanning tree and understanding the cost of each link is still the key to making these decisions well. So the root bridge, if we look at it, we've got a 21, a 21, a 30, and then we have a zero. So we'll say this is going to be the root here. So with that, each of these is going to be a designated port. We now need to look at the cost. Fast Ethernet to a gigabit is going to uh, revert to a fast Ethernet speed, which is going to give us the, uh, what is it, the uh, 1600 megabits per second is going to give us a cost of 19. The fast Ethernet to fast Ethernet is going to be a 19. Fast Ethernet to gig is going to be a 19. And the gig to the gig is going to be a cost of four. The root ports in this thing, maybe make it a little bit more obvious. To get to the root bridge, the root, this will be a root port going to the root bridge to the designated port. This one's going to be a root port. And you say, oh, that's pretty obvious. But if these were gigabit links going here and we had a four and a four and a four, That'd be 12, which is going to be less than 19. So its path, if we had gigabits, which we don't, would be in this direction. What, what that leaves us is this guy here. And so we're going to go here. This is going to be the root port, and this will be a designated port because we have a 19 and a 4. This is going to be a 23 versus a 38, 4, 9, 36, or 76, I guess, something like that. Yeah, I think 76 if we go in this direction. So that means, let me get some of this that we don't have out of here. That means that we've now got to figure out which of these is the forwarding port and which of these is going to be the designated port, the forwarding port, and which of these is going to be the block port in here. We're going to go to the lowest of, so 0021, 1BE, 1C, so I think that 1BE is going to be lower than the 1C, so let's say that this is going to be the, the designated port or the forwarding port, and this will be the block port here. Using the rules that we've kind of sort of talked about uh, as we've gone through this. Let me then, and I think the next one has the answers in it. We have the root port here, and this DP goes to the goes to goes to right here. It will go. This goes with this guy. The designated port or the forwarding port, forwarding port, root port. Root port cost of 19, 19. Uh, this is a designated port or a forwarding port. Designated port or a forwarding port. A cost of four that we have here. Root port to root port. Designated port, forwarding port. Root port to root port and then the block port to do the calculations uh, that we could go through and, and say, yep, this works. For this thing, the way that the system would go through and do the calculations uh, for it. Some optional features in the per VLAN spanning tree uh, plus port fast, uplink fast, and backbone fast. Port fast is one of my favorites and to shorten the, uh, the convergence time, and then BPDU guard is to protect us from. Somebody plug in a switch into the network. Uh, BPDU filter prevents the, uh, the specified ports from sending and receiving BPDUs. It basically disables the spanning tree protocol. Root guard is a configuration that's going to prevent somebody from putting in a switch that can become the root switch on the root bridge root switch on our network. Uh, superior BPDUs received on a root guard enable port sends this port to a root inconsistent state, which means it basically shuts it down. All these inconsistent states and error disabled states 
are just different words to say that it's not going to work until we take some actions uh, to uh, to correct the issue. Prevent support from becoming a root port in this thing, root port going to a root bridge, which which means that we're going to prevent somebody from uh, making our device uh, be to be making their device to become the root bridge. The root bridge path everything to the root bridge so that everything goes through it. Uh, prevent support from becoming a root port e effectively equal to a listening port and then uh, no traffic is forward across this port and enforces the position of the root switch. What it does is prevents another switch from becoming the root bridge. Loop guard, uh, spanning tree perceives a loop free topology when one of the ports no longer receives BPDUs and loop guard prevents the port from moving to the forwarding state. This is one of those situations that could happen if we have a problem with the media. And we have this thing called unidirectional, unidirectional link detection, which means that we could you be getting a trans we could be transmitting or we could be receiving, but we're not doing both. And that is something that can cause this sort of a problem. It's not receiving BPDUs, but it should be because Something happened in backhoe phase. Somebody cut the uh, backhoe phase is, is a term that somebody somebody uh, was digging and cut your fiber. But something happened to the fiber, and that's the easiest one to have one way working because when we were talking about it, we saw that yeah, we have to have two fibers. Something happened to one of the fiber. We're sending, but we're not receiving. The receive side is not there. Hey, we're not getting the BPDUs. We should now transition, but if we do transition in this case we're going to pre we're going to create a loop and that's what loop guard is designed to prevent well i was going to say earlier this is one of my favorites uh, another story true story you have students we used to have our machines start the bias would start them early in the morning uh, and by the time that the students got there, machines are up and running, ready to be logged into. Problem is they go to sleep. When they go to sleep, Microsoft puts the NIC to sleep, or if it's not being used, Microsoft may put the NIC to sleep. When the NIC goes to sleep, port goes down on the switch. Port goes down on the switch in the generic, the regular, the default configuration. Uh, we got to go through the spanning tree process, whether there is a, a, a device that can cause a loop uh, connected to it or whether there isn't uh, one that is connected to it. So we have a situation, had a situation, where students would come in, sit down at their computer, control out, delete, type in username and password, no authentication server available. Control, control alt delete no authentication server available networks down can't get to the active directory server can't log in can't log in because it takes as we saw about 50 seconds a minute roughly for uh, spanning tree to uh, uh, go through its process and determine that this computer is not going to cause a, a loop so when we do that, can cause issues, and it can cause issues to DHCP and I, again, on test banks, I've seen questions like uh, the device not getting a, a DHCP address. Well, could be, but DHCP, when we get there, it's got a lease time, so it's probably going to have an address, but can't get logged in because the port is in blocking state for that 50 seconds. Port fast is designed to fix that for us. Now we'll go up here to these guys, these machines, and, and demonstrate a couple of, of what goes on here. Let me turn this one off and turn it back on and see if we go through. We're going through the negotiation, 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 negotiation. Uh, one to the other. Right now I want to, uh, I want to, I don't want to delete that. I want to disconnect that switch because I want to connect it here again in a second. Actually, let me disconnect both of these switches. 
because we will reconnect them here. But we're still waiting. We're still trying to log in to the system. Trying to log into the system. And it gets pretty frustrating. You got to wait. Okay, now we can log in. We can fix that problem by breaking packet tracer. It's done this to me before. We restarted it and we're going through the spanning tree again. We can see that's there. We can fix this problem and I'm just going to do it on the uh, fast Ethernet uh, ports. We can also do it as a default big T and we'll go, go to interface, fast ether, interface range. If you want to do more than one port configuration at a time, you have to specify it as a range, an RA or range. Fast Ethernet 0, 1, 2, 24. And somebody said, hey, you're just typing FA. Do I, can I have to do that? I've been typing fast Ethernet the whole time. FA and then tab will do that for you. So we're going to go to the range and we'll do spanning tree, spanning tree, port fast. So now this gives me a bunch of warnings here. It's been configured, but will only have effect when the interface is in non-trunking mode. And it's in non-trunking mode. So now we have the situation, and let's turn this guy off and back on. The last time we did that, it took like forever. And now it immediately goes into forwarding state because we've told the system that we're not going to connect a switch to this guy. It ain't going to happen. Uh, it's an end. It's an end port, an end device, an end port uh, to do these things. So we don't have to go through all of the spanning tree. We immediately jumped, jump to the forwarding state. So then you say, well, what happens if somebody plugs a switch into it? If somebody plugs a switch into it, and let's go to Fast Ethernet 4, it's now going to go through, or should go through, the uh, regular show spanning tree. The regular startup process, this one's still in forwarding mode, 4 is, but the other end this bridge is root. The other end, we're doing the negotiation here. We're going into revert to a, a regular process. The other thing that could happen is we want to just shut the port down. And I'll probably mess this one up. Uh, let's go interface fast Ethernet 0, 24. Let's see, let's do this IP, BP. I, I forgot the command. Spanning tree. BPDU guard. And then we can either enable it or disable it. And let's do an enable. And this is on fast Ethernet 0, 0, 24. Four. So let's connect. This one has now done the negotiation. Said, hey, I didn't create a loop. So we can go through and do our thing here. Let's connect this guy, Fast Ethernet 024, to Fast Ethernet 024. It starts with the spanning tree. If this is working right, it immediately shuts it down. And if we go into the BPD, so the BPDU guard error detected putting it in error disable state. So if we go into here and do a show interface path in 0 slash 24, it, the protocol is down and it tells me that it's in error disable state. So a couple of things that we can do to make our network a little more efficient, particularly the end devices whenever we do them so that we do port fast we can get the computers up and running they can get logged in get ip addresses and all the other things that they need to do uh, overcoming the pc's inability to obtain a dhcp address uh, when a port failed to transition to the forwarding state in time 
Again, this could be the case that you fail to get a DHCP address. Our case was they couldn't get logged in. Couldn't get logged in because the port was in blocking state for the uh, for the 50 seconds. When they did get logged in, no problem. DHCP, all that other stuff worked just fine. It was on the network, could do all of the work. But it, it was very frustrating until it was a light cam comes on and says, oh yeah, this is the problem that we're having. These things are going through spanning tree and they don't need to. So we could do that. Uh, causes an access port to enter the forwarding state immediately. Uh, interfaces should not receive BPDUs. If they do receive a BPDU, then they're going to, as you saw in the uh, in the one case where we didn't do any other configurations, is we're going to go into the negotiation process, the spanning tree negotiation process. If we have the BPDU guard enabled, they're going to it's going to get a gets a BPDU is going to going to put the port into error disable mode. Can immediately transition to the blocking state if necessary, if configured to do that. And the blocking state we did with BPDU guard. Enable on access and trunk ports, on access switches, access switches at the access layer where we connect the devices to where we access the network. Uh, cannot be configured on dynamic or negotiated ports, things that we haven't talked about yet. What I will say is that uh, by default they're all dynamic ports. We have to change those and, and change them to switch port mode access in order to make it work. Spanning tree port fast, we can do it up per, per port or we can make it the default for the global. I just I didn't want it to be on the gig ports. We could have done a spanning tree in the config, spanning tree port fast default and all of the ports would have been in the, in the, uh, in the port fast mode. Show spanning tree and interface and the interface ID, uh, port fast for verification. And let's see, I don't know that that works in packet tracing. Yeah, maybe it does too. I think I said that to myself and then I did it. Show spanning tree. Uh, what was it? Spanning tree interface, right? Show spanning tree interface. Spanning tree inconsistent ports interface and then let's do fast Ethernet zero one when we look at it point point it's a designated designated port and it doesn't it's it's yeah spanning tree port fast it, it, that's what I thought it, it I, as I as I said I thought that it wouldn't do that. Uh, port fast verification uh, to do that. Let's, let's try the port fast command at the end of that. I don't think it'll change anything. Let's just see what we can do. Maybe it will. Port fast. Enable. So we have to do that one at a time. I wonder if that'll work for a range. Probably not. Interface. Yeah, that, that, when I did the tab and it didn't, nothing happened, it tells me that's not going to work. So we can check the interfaces one at a time and, and by using the port fast modifier after the show the interfaces. Uplink fast. This is one, the uplink fast. Uplink, we're going from one device to another device. And in this case, this is going to be either our blocked port here, the link between AS2 and DS2. One is blocked by spanning tree. A uh, link between AS2 and DS2 is going to fail. When that happens, it uh, reduces the lay time uh, from blocking to forward from 50 seconds to 1 to 3 seconds. So again, more configurations that we can do in order to make the recovery time uh, much quicker. We started out looked at with the default with the uh, uh, the per VLAN spanning tree protocol we had almost a minute and now we're up to recovery time here to one to three seconds which is a lot more reasonable than the 50 seconds. Should not be used on the core distribution switches. Access switches furthest from the root or where it should be 
ensures that the switch won't become a root, sets the switch priority to 49,152, and the STP port costs are increased to three, by 3,000, and 40, uh, 128 is the default uh, uh, for the port cost. Uses the alternate blocking port uh, for the path to the root to do these things. And it's enabled globally only uh, for these things. The dummy frames are sent, and this is going to be a MAC address that it, that it uses 01000CCD. CDCD uh, will be the, uh, the MAC address that it uses to send these things. Backbone fast. Uh, you switch labels the switch to recover from an indirect failure uh, detected by inferior BPDUs for this thing. We have the root here, uh, and then we have a, a port P. Uh, the C here, when we go to these things, we have a failure here. So this guy has now got to uh, come up, and we talk about the 20 seconds to do this thing, plus the 30 seconds, the 50 seconds. Uh, to do that, the the uh, backbone fast should enable the switch to recover an indirect failure, one that's not directly associated with it. Indirect over here uh, to do these things. Yeah, it goes from that to 30 seconds. BPDU guard we looked at in the uh, in the configuration find protection against loops when port fast is enabled and yeah we can do that port fast is enabled if we plug a switch into it it's going to uh, uh, go into the negotiation process it's going to revert to a standard uh, spanning tree port bpdu guard immediately puts the port into error disable mode so that it's not going to send anything anywhere to me these things where, where we shut them down is is sends a message without you going and directly telling somebody, hey, you really messed up that, hey, I really messed up. I shouldn't have done that. Uh, what happened? It was always nothing. I just turned the computer on uh, to do these things. Protection against loops when port fast is enabled. Uh, the port fast interfaces uh, will not receive BPDUs, error disables, and shuts down the port that receives a BPDU regardless of the port fast configuration for the same. Configured globally, uh, effective, uh, effective only on the ports in the operational port fast, the edge state. Uh, the edge ports, the ones that are at the edge of the network that we plug devices into, computers and servers and those sorts of things, not switches and anything that can cause a loop, are, gonna, are going to be called edge ports. The biggest indicator of an edge port is port fast. Uh, to do that, when we what 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 is the, one of the things that's going to happen is going to be a port fast enabled port. A port does not have to be port fast in order to have BPDU guard enabled on it. Some of the <coughs> configurations here, the default configurations, a spanning tree, uh, enable state. It's enabled on VLAN one. Uh, we hopefully made sense when we went back and changed, some, added some VLANs and and made them the uh, the port, uh, the the, the uh, yeah the port, the uh, root bridge for uh, some of the other VLANs. The spanning tree mode is per VLAN spanning tree plus is the default, the Cisco default for this thing. The switch priority thirty two seven sixty eight is the default everything has that priority the uh, root priority or port priority is uh, 128 the spanning tree cost and again here we're using the old values you can see uh, a gig for 100 mag 19 and a 10 mag 100 for these things the uh, vlan port priority uh, is going to be 128 uh, the spanning tree hello timer two seconds which means that it's going to be sending information every two seconds. The forward delay, 15 seconds. The maximum aging, and this is the default again, it's a per VLAN spanning tree plus, is going to be 10 times the hello time. Uh, transmit hole count for this is going to be six BPDUs uh, for this thing. Configuring it, and we've done a number of these things already, I think. Configure terminal, 
spanning tree mode. We did that. We, we changed it from the per VLAN spanning tree to the rapid per VLAN spanning tree. Uh, select PVST plus to enable that MST for multiple spanning tree. RSTP for the rapid per VLAN spanning tree. Uh, spanning tree VLAN uh, range. We can configure the range of VLANs. We, can, we don't have to do one VLAN at a time in order to do that. The end end command returns us to the privilege exec mode. If we're deep into the configuration, exit goes up one step at a time. If we're in config T and then we're going to configure interface, if we exit from configure interface, we will exit into uh, the, uh, the configuration, the uh, global configuration mode. So per VLAN uh, for these things, another uh, chart here, spanning tree, Standard spanning tree is the original low resources, slow to converge. One spanning tree porter call, one STP tree on the entire switch. Per VLAN spanning tree plus, it's a Cisco proprietary, it's a Cisco default, high resource usage, slow convergence, and we have one spanning tree tree, one spanning tree uh, process running per VLAN. Uh, rapid spanning tree 802.1W, uh, medium on the resources, fast on the convergence, and then uh, one for the number of trees. Uh, plus, uh, rapid plus, again Cisco proprietary, resources very high. Fast convergence, one per VLAN. And the, the RP, the V, the R, PV on these things, each is the per VLAN. Multiple 802.1s and Cisco 802.1s is the standard. Uh, it's fast convergent. Uh, number of trees one for multiple VLANs, where we uh, group the VLANs together for these things. Uh, some more commands that we should be using uh, for the uh, uh, for the labs, and uh, we'll have to see if if where we stand on those things. The configurations on the edge port. When we do that, port 5 is designated forwarding port uh, 19. This port is a is in port fast mode. BPDU guard is enabled. The different configurations on this, and this is to show spanning tree interface fast Ethernet 01 detail instead of the standard that goes on with it. Spanning tree enabled protocol rapid spanning tree and then we can look at those things with the show spin this is a show spanning tree obviously uh, when we when we look at it. I'm going to